Hey, we're live. Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. As you know, I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits. And it's my hope that through my videos and through these live streams, I can help you learn too. This weekend was crazy busy. On Friday, uh, the folks that I work with at Ohio Health MS Center, we put on a really live CME or a continuing medical education program. I was filled with joy because over 200 practitioners, doctors, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, physical therapists, occupational therapists, hey Matt, they all got together and we uh, gave them lectures on provocative topics, stem cell transplantation, I spoke on cannabis, on new um, biomarkers, on various aspects of pelvic floor physical therapy, occupational therapy with home adaptations. Um, it was really a lot of fun, uh, and I really hope that we had an opportunity to educate. Now, I'm starting to see some folks come online. Matt, as always, it's great to see you, buddy. Benjamin's online. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, hello, Sharon. Howdy to Sarah. Matt Z, what's up, my man? Uh, Michelle's online. Hello. I've got uh, Vicky coming on uh, from Connecticut. Divine is uh, with us. That's wonderful. I've got Joel here from Dayton. Hello, Joel. Uh, Cindy's online, Michelle, Josh Verity, what's up, my man? Uh, this is fantastic. As always, as we start to get the live stream kicking, please jump on and share it with us a hello, howdy, hi, and tell us where you're calling in from. It's super fun uh, to talk to people from all around the globe. Um, this is uh, great to see you, James from Illinois. I've got Aaron Brown saying hi. Hello, uh, Melissa. Uh, hello, Damian and Robin. Uh, hello to listening one. This is wonderful. Uh, now, the second thing that I like to remind folks is when we're doing a live q and I can't diagnose you, I can't uh, treat you uh, through the interwebs. And so please keep in mind that I can't uh, have you type in a personal story and have me give you an accurate medical opinion. Please make sure that your questions are general enough that they apply to everyone. Uh, you know, it was my intention, guys, that I was gonna video live stream during the Friday CME, and it didn't work out. Uh, truth be told, I couldn't get up myself put together early enough in the morning to get my camera and all my gear over to the site. Uh, and so I missed out on that opportunity and I wasn't able to bring that to you guys. And I feel a little guilty about that, so I'm sorry. I will tell you that we had a professional videographer there, um, an amazing videographer from Ohio Health. And I asked him if he would share with me the MP4s and he said that he would. So if I can figure out the technical savvy, it's my full intention to post those videos from this Friday CME on my YouTube channel. And so let's keep our fingers crossed that I can figure out how to do that uh, and I can share those lectures with you. I also wanted to share that Saturday we put on uh, with our partners, MS Views and News, a really fun and exciting patient symposia. There were over 170 patients and partners all gathered in Columbus, Ohio. It was broadcast live on Facebook, and this was really a collaboration effort with Ohio Health MS Center and with MS Views and News. Uh, and so some of you might have caught that uh, on Facebook. Now, both Friday and Saturday, I gave a lecture on cannabis and multiple sclerosis, a super hot topic. Uh, and some It's a topic that I've been working on the lecture for months now. And I, I brought my phone with me, and I actually asked my fellow, Dr. Bite to film and brought uh, into live stream my lecture yesterday. Unfortunately, she had some technical difficulties with the phone. I was on stage and I couldn't come down to help her. And so yet again, we missed an opportunity. So um, I asked my wife if she would be okay with me jumping online tonight. And she said, yes, the kids are upstairs doing their homework. Uh, and so hence the impromptu, how do you do? Thank you guys for joining me. There are 84 people online. This is freaking awesome. I'm loving it. Uh, let's take a look and see some of the questions. I've got John from BC Canada. What's up, John? Ada, it's nice to see you from Long Island. So Michelle writes in, my most frustrating MS symptom is constant tingling and numbness in the bilateral hands and feet, ongoing for three years, straight uh, this August. Is there anything I can do to relieve this? Well, Michelle, first of all, my heart goes out to you because that's a terrible symptom. Numbness and tingling are pretty common. Um, the spinal cord has to take all the sensory information when your hand is being touched 
up the nerve, into the spinal cord, up into the brain. And if there's damage along the spinal cord from MS, which is pretty common, or if there's damage in the brain from MS, then the sensations get mucked up. And people can feel a buzzing, they can feel a numbness. Some people describe this as like when their limb goes to sleep, except it's constant. Now, there are some medicines that can help with this, Michelle. And I wanna be straightforward in telling you that we in neurology, our medicines work better to treat painful numbness. Uh, the doctor term is dysesthesia. So we do a better job of treating painful numbness than we do treating just straight out numbness. We use the same medications. Uh, and so in no particular order, I'll share some of the ones that I like to try to use. Medications like gabapentin, which is called Neurontin, or uh, pregabalin, which is Lyrica, or Cymbalta, which is a really good one that I like to use. Some of the old tricyclic antidepressants um, like Elevil and Pamelor and Amipramine can be very, very helpful. Now, I like to try these medicines and sometimes they help. Sometimes they help a lot sometimes not so much. Sometimes I find that we can use a lidoderm cream or a lidoderm patch uh, on skin that's numb and ouchy. Uh, the truth though is that it's very challenging to treat numbness and sometimes we're uh, left with some residual sensations that we do not like. And so if you haven't tried those medicines, Michelle, I would most certainly talk to your MS provider and see if they have any um, tricks up their sleeve that you guys could try together. But sometimes with pharmacology, we can do okay. So uh, I've got people uh, calling in from all over the place. There's literally a hundred people and I want to raise my bottle and celebrate because we've never had a hundred people on a YouTube uh, live chat before. So that's really, really freaking cool. So Matt writes in, Matt Z, um, where does question go? Uh, darn it, Matt, I lost your question. Let's see here. Um, all right. So, Matt, I'm sorry I lost your question. This live stream's going kind of quick. Uh, Cindy writes in and says, Dr. Boster, it seems like the pain increases um, with inclement weather coming through. Is there any studies being done to monitor whether pressure changes affect us? So uh, that's a great question, Cindy. And I'll be honest in that. I'm not aware of any studies looking at barometric pressure. Um, it's very well known that when it gets cold outside, spasticity gets worse. Sometimes neuropathic pain can get worse. It's well known that when it gets hot outside, people can have a heat sensitive symptoms. I'll share with you anecdotally. I have a lot of patients that feel like things get worse when the barometric pressure changes. Now, although I'm not aware of studies, I, I don't think that I have hundreds of patients that are all getting together and saying, I got an idea. Let's tell Boster this. And there's probably some truth to it. Uh, I'll share with you, that's going to be my homework, is to go back to the medical literature and take a look and, and, and see if I've missed anything. But, you know, when my patient tells me that they notice that their MS symptoms intensify with changes in barometric pressure, I tend to believe them. What else do we have here? Um, I've got Prince who writes in, can MS be diagnosed via myelogram or must it be an MRI? Now, Prince is talking about two different kinds of imaging technology. A myelogram is kind of an older technology. And what we do is we do a lumbar puncture. So we put a needle into the fecal sac. It's a sac that carries the spinal cord in the brain. And it's a bag of water, if you will. And they inject dye into the sac. And this is a dye that shows up with an x-ray. And then they literally turn the human being, kind of slosh uh, back and forth the dye. So it fills all of the spinal fluid and they take x-rays. And they can sort of outline uh, the spinal uh, the spinal cord because the, the dye around it is now showing up on the x-ray. And if there's a compression of the spinal cord, imagine a disc that's pushing the spinal cord. Well, then on the myelogram, there'll be a divot. And so they can see that. What the myelogram can't do is it can't teach us about the actual tissue of the spinal cord. Uh, and so we don't learn whether or not there's MS lesions in the spinal cord and we don't learn very much about the brain. As a result, myelogram technology is not very helpful in trying to diagnose MS or trying to manage MS. An MRI, on the other hand, gives you a gorgeous picture of the actual tissue of the spinal cord in the brain. And so you can see whether or not there's inflammatory lesions, you can see if there's enhancing lesions, you can see if there's uh, T1 black holes in the spinal cord and brain. 
And so an MRI is much more useful than a myelogram. And a myelogram for, excuse me, for MS really doesn't work out. It's not the best option. Good question. Uh, so what else do we have here? So Janine writes in, should one have uh, something to worry about if one has a problem with swallowing liquids? Just a yes or no is okay. So Janine, the answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes. In fact, if you're noticing that when you drink liquids or if when you're eating solids or even just your own saliva, if you're having trouble with swallowing, that can be very serious. Um, the, when I think about the way that someone with MS can leave this world, I'm talking about death, very serious topic. There's three things that I'm constantly keeping in the front of my mind. One of them is a decubitus ulcer where bacteria seeds the bone and you develop something called osteomyelitis and sepsis and die. Yuck. Uh, hence the terrible importance of making sure that we don't get decubitus ulcers or skin ulcers or bed sores is another name. And if we do have them, we have to treat them aggressively. The second one is urosepsis, where someone has a urinary tract infection and it tracks back in the bladder into the kidneys, causing a raging infection, which can cause someone to pass away. The third option relevant to your question has to do with swallowing. And if you uh, have food or water that goes down that front tube, the air tube, you can get what's called an aspiration pneumonia, where you have... Uh, uh, food and water and particulate matter in the lungs. And that can set up a really bad infection. A pneumonia can lead to sepsis and death. So if you're having problems with swallowing, I implore you to tell your clinician, tell your primary care doctor, tell your MS doctor, tell your nurse practitioner, your physician's assistant. And there are a lot of tests that can be done to sort it out. I am very fortunate that at the comprehensive MS center where I get to work at Ohio Health, we have amazing speech pathologists. And these men and women um, will come to the clinic. They'll assess a patient's swallowing. They may have them literally swallow. And they can do what's called a modified barium swallow test in the clinic room. And so we can very quickly learn how safe someone's swallowing. If you're having trouble swallowing, there are techniques that we can use to make it safer. So one of the techniques that I like is called a chin tuck, where you put the food or water in your mouth, you forcibly drop the head so that your chin is down. And what that does is it protects the airway and then you swallow really hard. So I'll demonstrate a chin tuck. So that's one of many, many techniques. There's even ways of thickening liquids. You can add something to it so that it's a little bit thicker and that can make it easier to swallow. The point here is you don't want to allow yourself to have an aspiration pneumonia. Many people aren't aware that they're aspirating. And so if you are sputtering or coughing <clears throat> or having trouble in eating, don't let that slide. That's important stuff. Thank you for asking the question. So Eric Brown is online. Um, and Eric Brown asks, do you have to see your neurologist um, more after Lemtrada? Well, that's a great question, Eric. Now, I'm very biased. I really think that Lemtrada is an excellent drug. It's one of several um, top-notch high efficacy therapies that we like to use at Ohio Health to beat up on MS. Limtrada is a complex medicine to give. And so before you get Limtrada, we have to have a skin exam, we have to have a neck palpation. If you have a cervix, you need to have a pap smear, and there's a bunch of blood work. And I really think you need to spend some time talking to the neurologist about the safety, what happens after Limtrada, because there's a special diet to follow, you have to take antiviral pills uh, for months at a time. And then after the five days of the infusion, then you're being monitored. You have monthly blood draws. And in my clinic, we like to see you about every three months. So in the year after your first set of infusions, we're going to see you three or four times. We're going to infuse you the second year. And then we're going to continue to see you about every three months. I don't know how often you're currently seeing your neurologist. Um, but for us, a three-month clip is, is pretty standard, not just for Limtrada, but for other medicines. Now, once a year for five years while you're uh, after Lymtrata, I want you to have another skin exam. I want you to have another neck palpation. I want you to have another pap smear at least once a year if you have a cervix. And we have to get monthly blood draws. So whereas you may not be coming into the neurologist more often, you may be being seen by medical personnel to monitor and keep things safe. Guys, I have to tell you, there's 120 people online. 
Um, I've never done a live stream on a Sunday night, and this is an awesome response. If you're digging this, please give it a thumbs up. It makes me feel great and lets me know that what we're doing is working. Uh, so let's uh, go on to some other questions. Vicky says, thank you to your family. So honey, Vicky said, thank you for letting me do this live stream tonight. Um, so uh, my wife uh, says you're welcome from the other room. Um, two listening, one, ah, Sunday night homework. That's right, I've got the kids upstairs. Uh, math uh, is being done, uh, reading is being done. There's some good stuff going on. And once they're done, uh, I was uh, lenient and they're gonna be able to play some Fortnite. So we could, that's a whole different kind of conversation. Now, um, let's look for some more questions. Frankie and Johnny write, hi doc, can you still be diagnosed with MS with a negative spinal tap? Frankie and Johnny, hello, how are you? And the answer is yes. I have a video on my YouTube channel about how do you diagnose MS and the five steps. The first one is your clinical history. The second one is your neurological examination. The third one is your MRI. Now, very often in 2019, this is enough to figure out MS. The fourth one is a spinal tap. And I probably do a spinal tap only 10% of the time because I don't need it to make the diagnosis. Um, you don't need a spinal tap to make the diagnosis. And if the spinal tap is negative, then it still doesn't disprove MS. So there are situations where the spinal tap can make or break the diagnosis or provide clarity, but it's not a requirement to make the diagnosis. No, the answer to your question is you can diagnose MS even with a negative spinal tap, or even if you don't do a spinal tap. So uh, Cindy writes in a warm thank you uh, to Mrs. Boster, right on. Um, Sarah Edwards is online. I have a, uh, a pain. Anything, something cool touches my skin. What can I do for this? Now, Sarah, I, I spoke a little bit on the beginning of this live stream about uh, numbness. And I said, we do a better job treating pain than we do numbness. And so you're describing a kind of pain, a neuropathic pain where things feel cold and they're not. And we find that if we use medicines like antidepressant medicines or anti-seizure medicines, they have um, a side effect of helping with neuropathic pain. So someone who is not clinically depressed or who doesn't have epilepsy, but does have a cold or a burning sensation from their MS may find themselves on one of these medicines to help. And we generally can do a pretty good job dampening, minimizing, and hopefully knocking out neuropathic pain. I even have some patients that end up getting a spinal cord stimulator that's very rare, but there are certain types of neuropathic pain that we can treat with medicine by Edison, spinal cord stimulators. So let's see what else we've got here. Bruce Owen is online. Hi, Aaron Boster, we missed uh, you helping us. We well, you know what, I'm glad to be here. Bruce, the reason I jumped online is it was my full intention that I was gonna be videoing the CME program that we at Ohio Health MS Center put on this Friday, and that didn't work out. And I also thought that I would be videoing at least my cannabis lecture that I did Saturday yesterday at this giant patient symposia that we put on with MS Views and News right here in Columbus, Ohio. And that didn't work out. And so I was missing you guys. Uh, there's a video that I've uploaded, which will launch tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., where I answer commonly asked questions. And so you guys can look forward to seeing that, I hope. But I didn't want to go the weekend without saying, hello, howdy, hi. And I'm excited. There's literally 130 of you. This is freaking awesome. So keep those thumbs up coming um, if you're enjoying what we're doing. And it looks like Sunday nights might be a decent night to do live streams, guys. Um, other questions. Hello from Long Island, New York. Ah, um, this thing's scrolling on me. I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can sorting it out. Um, all right, so Cheryl Palmer writes in, what's the fifth criteria for diagnosis? Cheryl, I'm sorry, you're right. I said there was five, I got to four and I stopped. So real quick, number one, history. Number two, neuro exam. Number three, MRI. Number four, spinal fluid. Number five is, hey, Aaron, prove it's nothing else. So there's a bunch of things that mimic MS from B12 deficiency to a spinal, uh, a spinal disc that's pushing to a tumor, to a stroke, to infections like Lyme disease. So there's a lot of other things to check, mostly by getting MRIs uh, and by doing laboratories to cross things off our list. That way, if you go to a family reunion, and some smart Alex says, well, how do you know it's not syphilis? Then you can say, shut up, dude, he checked and it was negative <laughs> so that we know. So there you are, uh, Cheryl. I'm sorry that I forgot the fifth one. Um, and thanks for bringing it up. 
Rotten One is online. Rotten One says, for me, my issue is, is getting into bed. Hurts my knees like crazy. Pure fire. Now, MS doesn't cause knee, knee pain directly. But if MS makes you walk kind of funny, like sort of on the side of your foot, or if it makes you have a hitch in your giddy up, or if you're leaning when you walk, it can put unusual stressors on the leg and that can beat up the joints. And so it's not uncommon that people with MS that are walking develop knee or hip or ankle pain, not directly from MS, but indirectly from the way MS is making them walk. One of the very best things that I could recommend for someone with knee pain is to see a physical therapist. They might be able to help a great deal. Um, sometimes we have to work with rheumatology folks that can do injections in the knees. I even have patients that have had knee transplants and knee transplants are amazing in 2019. Quite literally, you get a knee done and they get you up walking around the same, the same day. Wow. Um, but, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. We're going to start by having a physical therapist assess the knees um, and see what they can do with working on gait mechanics. Oftentimes, that's a great place to start. Cameron is online. Cameron, how are you? It's great to see you, my friend. I hope that you and your family are doing well. Um, Matt Z is on. Um, it seems like a spinal tap is so 1980s compared to now. You know, it, it's interesting uh, because the 2017 revised McDonald criteria allow uh, a positive spinal tap to take the place of a second MRI. And so even though you're right, it's kind of 1980s, it's sort of come back in vogue in some respects. I still don't find that I need it very often at all to make a diagnosis. Every once in a while, it can be very helpful. Um, but I, again, in my clinic, we're probably doing it less than 10% of the time. Damien, uh, where to go? Damien, oh man, I am missing some. Guys, if I miss your question, it's not on purpose. I'm not super awesome at scrolling. You'd think that I would have better skills at that, but I guess not. All right, so um, Michelle Charles writes, if I have vision loss with optic neuritis and it's been over a year, chances are that the vision will not return, Correct. I was given oral and IV steroids during the relapse. And um, with much sadness, the answer is yes. If you've had a year and the, the damage has not fully recovered, it's very unlikely that you're going to have further improvement. Now, I have seen it, but I don't want to give you false hope. And if it's been a year, the damage that you're left with is likely going to stick around. Again, there have been situations where it's gotten better later, and I love when that happens. Um, but you may very well be left with residual deficits. And that's why we want you on a disease modifying therapy because we don't want to have optic neuritis in the other eye, God forbid, or we don't want um, you to have another attack. And so we want to take essentially like a birth control pill against future attacks. Um, Blue Fort Wade writes, my doctor has prescribed Joenia. Is it a safe medicine? Well, Blue Fort, uh, how do you do? A happy Sunday night to you. Um, I have a lot of patients on Jelenia. Uh, this is a medicine that's an oral medicine for MS that came out in October 2010. Um, I think that it's a good MS medicine. It's not amongst the very top, but very, very close. Um, it's a high efficacy drug in many respects. I think it is safe. There's a couple things that we have to pay attention to. And I have several videos on my channel talking about Jelenia. In a quick nutshell, before you start Jelenia, you have to check to make sure you've been exposed to chickenpox. And if you don't manifest an immunity against chickenpox, you need to be immunized oftentimes. We have to do some eye tests to know the health of the eye before we start. And we need to know what your liver looks like. We also have to make sure that you're not on medicines that can alter the conduction of the heart. And on the first day you take the pill, there's a first dose observation where we literally take your EKG to look at your heart rhythm, and then we give you the pill, and then we monitor you for six hours with uh, blood pressures and vital signs once every hour, and at the end of the six hours, we get another EKG. Now, typically, the heart rate drops on the first day you take Joanna by only 20%, which is not clinically relevant, but we monitor you anyways, and God forbid it went down too low or didn't come right back up, we'd admit you in the hospital. Now, there's no second dose effect. It's literally just the first dose. And so after you have the first dose, then you don't need to worry about that. Um, while you're on Jelenia in the first year, we want to do a special eye test called a fundus photography. I do that twice, typically at month three or four, and then once again at the end of the year. And then I don't think that we need to do it uh, after that. And we want to check liver enzymes. And so we're going to check liver enzymes 
once every three months. And I like to get a blood count along with that. Uh, so there are some things that you need to be looking at. Me personally, I like it when my MS patients on Joinia get a, a skin exam once a year. I don't want to get my patients naked. I like my patients to wear clothes. So I joke, I send you to a naked doctor so they can write me a letter. Say, dear Aaron, his skin looks great. Love, naked doctor. Uh, and that way we feel reassured. So what else do we have going on? Um, I've got uh, Michael Dial on the line. Any idea how to improve minor leakage after going number one? I'm not sure if this is MS thing, age or both. Well, you know, Michael, it's really, really common, like insanely common that people with MS can have some urinary leakage. And the way you're describing this makes me think about urinary retention. I have YouTube videos about the anatomy of the bladder. Uh, and so if you check out my uh, playlist called Sex, Drugs, um, and um, Multiple Sclerosis, you can find some information on this. But in a nutshell, you can have a situation where the bladder, which is like a balloon, fills up with urine, but the outflow track is tight and you can't get the urine out. And so in that case, the pressure builds up and the pressure builds up and you may feel the need to go, but it doesn't all come out. And if the pressure gets up big enough, then you'll start to leak and you may find that you have some dribbling or some leaking. Now, fortunately, there are lots of medicines to take care of this problem. And the best way to start to address it is to tell your MS doctor. There are tests that we do in the clinic where we well, we have an ultrasound machine that goes on the surface of your belly. So we can measure your belly and see how much urine is in your bladder. And then we have you empty into a container and we measure how much is in the container. And then we check it a second time. We look at your bladder again and we can see how much residual PP is left over. And if you have more than say 150 uh, milliliters or cc's of urine, you're retaining. Now, fortunately, there's a lot of medicines like Flomax is a medicine I like to use to open up the bladder neck to let that urine out. So my point here is you don't have to live with that. There are things that can be done and bring it to the attention of your clinician so they can help you out. What else is going on? Um, Tommy's Hot Rod Garage. It's kind of a cool name. Um, hello from Joe Mammal. Um, sorry we missed seeing you yesterday. You know, I'm sorry that we missed you guys also, but it's going to be live stream um, on Facebook. We're going to post it. I hope to post some stuff on YouTube in the next couple of weeks. And so even though you missed those lectures, I hope that you have a chance to catch them later. Um, Lazaro Gonzalez writes from Miami. Hello. Um, how long before Okravis um, can W-I-T-K? I'm not sure what that means. Um, I'm going to keep moving because I'm not really sure. Wow, there's 141 people online now. This is insane. I'm loving it. I've got uh, Cheryl Palmer online. Says no problem. Thank you, doctor. My husband thanks you too. Well, you guys are super welcome. Um, what else do I have down here? I've got uh, John Scaparno from Michigan. What's going on? I would scream go blue, but uh, people might attack me in, in my house here in Columbus, so I won't say that too loud. Um, Kelly says, yeah, I'm awake on Sunday evening. Can we vote? Um, we can vote on something. Um, if you guys prefer to do a Sunday evening live stream compared to the Saturday and Sunday mornings, keep up the thumbs up. If I can get over 100 thumbs up, that's going to be a, a very clear sign that Sunday nights are the thing. So if you're digging it, thumbs up so that we know that th Sunday nights are the thing. Um, I've got someone calling in from the Pacific Northwest. Um, there doesn't seem to be any acceptance of Lentrada. With the, Nash, with the regional MS center. Uh, they classify it as AIDS in a bottle. Will this attitude change in time? You know what? I certainly hope so. Lymtrata is not AIDS in a bottle. That's kind of an ugly comment. Uh, Lymtrata, in my opinion, is one of the three most effective medicines to treat MS. Um, I would say that Lymtrata, Tysabri, and Okravis, in my opinion, in 2019, are the three best medicines that we have from an efficacy standpoint. Lymtrata is the only medicine current FDA approved, which is induction therapy. So it's really philosophically a different way of treating your MS. Every other therapy is continuous. So you take it constantly. You take Ogrevis twice a year. You take Tysabri once a month. You take Joinia once a day. You take uh, beta serum three times a week. You take Tecpidera twice a day. With Lymtrata, you take five days, wait a year, take three days, and then most people never get treated again. Over half of people go out eight years and don't get retreated. And in my experience, people that want to take Lentrata philosophically are willing to put up with some drama. There's risk, there's complications. 
It's a complicated medicine to track and monitor, but they're willing to put up with that for the chance at having nothing happen, for the chance of maybe going eight years and not having to take a therapy. Now, Lemtrada is not for most patients, but to your point, uh, we don't need to vilify it. It's not AIDS in a bottle. And if a doctor ever dared say that to me, I would remind them that they must not be very good at their job and they must be scared. And if you're scared or not good at something, I don't think you should do it. But there's plenty of places around the country where we know how to give Lemtrada safely. Uh, we at Ohio Health, I think we do it pretty darn well. And it's with great pride that I share that we literally have people that fly in from other parts of the world so they can receive Lemtrada under our supervision. Uh, I don't think that you want to give Lemtrada casually. I wouldn't want to give it to like one or two people. We've uh, used Lemtrada in over 260 folks. Um, and some people have had three courses. And so we have a lot of experience that makes us uh, very, very sensitized to how to take care of people on the drug. You know, my father years ago needed to have hand surgery. And I found him an orthopedic surgeon that only worked from here up. He didn't do elbows. He didn't do shoulders. He didn't do knees or hips. This dude worked on hands only. And that's the kind of guy that I want to operate on my father. So if you're going to receive highly effective therapy, it's my biased opinion that you want to go to a center where they're really, really comfortable and they know how to do that. My friend Derek is online. Hello, my friend. He writes in, Hey, Dr. B, um, I am in for my Tysabri infusions in the morning. I have only seen my neurologist once in the past 18 months, and I have some concerns. Is this a normal time frame? So I know that you're writing in from uh, on the other side of the pond in Great Britain. Uh, I can share with you here in the United States that, that there is a law, a REMS program, that requires that we see patients every three months. And so we see our patients on Tysabri every three months. Now, sometimes I might stretch it out to four or six months in patients that have been on therapy for a long time and whom I really trust and we have a really tight relationship. Uh, but I think 18 months, uh, if I'm blunt, is too long. Uh, and if you have concerns, or even if you don't have concerns, I don't think a patient should ever go more than six months without a touching base. I even think that a year uh, is a really, really long time. Um, I've got 55 thumbs up. Guys, again, if we can get 100 thumbs up, it's going to let me know that yes, 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 Sunday nights are the thing to do. Um, so I've got uh, Mr. Motard, uh, hi from Columbus. My doctor gave me an MRI and said I don't have MS, and that's it. Should I get a second opinion? Well, there's a lot more to the story than just an MRI. And it's my opinion that if you are concerned and it's your brain, it's your potential disease, it's your body, it's reasonable to get a second opinion. Now, I, I think that you can take it too far. I don't think that a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth opinion. I mean, I've been a patient's 10th opinion before. And I, I, do, I, I think that you can take anything too far. But getting a second opinion, to have a second set of eyes and a second person thinking about uh, whether or not you might have a given disease isn't bad. And so if you're unsatisfied, it might be reasonable to get a second opinion. Now, you want to make sure that second opinion is a specialist in the area of interest. And so if you have concerns about MS and you uh, saw a, um, a general neurologist, or even if you saw an MS specialist, my second opinion, sh it should be with another MS specialist. It shouldn't just be with just anyone because you don't need another neurologist. You have a neurologist. You need someone who is specialized in that area and can really think about it with you deeply. Uh, so I hope that information helps. Um, rotten one. Could it be um, neuropathic type thing? For my last question, yes, it could be neuropathic. Um, Matt writes in. Uh, it varies from person to person. That's exactly right. Um, so uh, Beverly is sharing, uh, click the thumbs up under the video. That's what Dr. Boster is tracking. That's right. So down below the video, you can hit that thumbs up button. Um, some people are doing that. This is freaking cool. I've got 74 thumbs up. We've got 143 people online. Um, Kayla Walker writes in, what are your thoughts on using cannabis to help with neuropathy? Kayla, that's the question. Thank you for asking that question. Um, as I shared with you earlier uh, on this live stream, this weekend for the first time ever, I spoke publicly about cannabis and MS. Now I've done some YouTube videos on my opinions on cannabis and MS, but this was a CME to doctors to help educate them. Um, 
on cannabis and MS. And then yesterday, Saturday, I did a live patient program where I talked about it. Now, I want to make a couple points. Um, Kayla, I'm not talking about my personal opinions, about my own thoughts on ganja or marijuana. I'm also not talking about the legalities of MS or um, in, in cannabis. I, I'm not making a comment about uh, the history of cannabis. I do want to make a comment about the quality of data for neuropathic pain and spasticity. The reality is that the, the research that's been done hasn't been very robust. The clinical trials have limitations and they're not perfect. And so the, the, the quality of research is lacking. We need more really, really good properly run clinical trials so that we can have really firm answers about uh, how cannabis helps symptoms in MS. That being said, when you look at the many small clinical trials that have been done for cannabis and pain, generally speaking, there is some benefit. And many of the trials have a couple patient reported outcome measures where people feel they're better. But I want to make a couple other points. Most of what's studied was not smoked cannabis, like where you light a, a, a joint and smoke marijuana. It was not with edible cannabis. It was with various uh, other ways of ingesting it, like oral mucosal spray, something that's not available here in the United States. And so there are some risks with smoked cannabis, cardiovascular risks uh, that you don't want to discount. And I think that we have to keep that in mind. Also, um, there's other things about cannabis that it can impact, like cognition. And so it's not a completely and utterly benign process. I do uh, want to share, though, that anecdotally, I have patients that use THC and or CBD, and it helps their neuropathic pain, or at least they tell me that it helps their neuropathic pain. And I don't think they're lying to me. I think they're probably being serious and honest. Um, let's see here. Uh, there's some really weird stuff that people write in sometimes. <laughs> um, so any recommendations for speech recovery or, or is it just time? I got primary progressive MS. So there is a type of specialist called a speech pathologist. And if you haven't seen a speech pathologist, you should. A speech pathologist can help you learn to speak again properly. They can help you project your voice. They can help you enunciate. Um, they're really, really good at that. And so they can literally kind of do physical therapy for the speaking. If you're having difficulties with uh, MS interfering with your speaking, slurred speech, difficulty with phonating, difficulty being loud enough that people can hear you. Working with a speech pathologist is the bomb.com because they're awesome at what they do and they can really help you. And so you want to talk to your MS provider about maybe having um, some time with a speech pathologist. They can be super helpful. Uh, Pinewood writes in, Dr. B, is there a therapy that can help uh, with allodynia? Showering and rubbing, uh, clothes rubbing on my skin can be so painful. Thanks. And then they write, go blue. Um, and so we've got a football rivalry here. So the, the, uh, the question allodynia, allodynia is a doctor word. That means normal light touch doesn't feel normal. It actually hurts. And this is terrible. I have patients that they don't want their spouse to hug them because squeezing their, their skin hurts them really bad. Or they, they dread, as this patient points out, putting something on their skin, even clothes. And so, yes, there are medicines, the same medicines that help with other forms of neuropathic pain, burning, cold, itching can help with allodynia. And sometimes I find that a lidoderm cream, uh, lidoderm, so lidocaine is like what the dentist gives you when he numbs up your mouth. It can come in like a cream and you can rub it on the area or it can come in a, in a patch that you stick on the area and that can really be very helpful. Um, so I would seek out some of those options because that sounds horrible and I don't want you to have that problem. Um, so Divine writes in, Dr. Aaron, have you done uh, or have you thought about doing a TED Med talk? Um, that's something that you've ever thought about. You know, it's interesting, Divine. I, I uh, only started to watch TED Talks like a week ago. I never really watched TED Talks. Uh, my family has watched them quite a bit, um, but I am amazed at TED Talks. And it's like, you know, nine to 15 minutes of super intense, awesome learning. Um, I hadn't thought about doing a TED Talk before, uh, but maybe, maybe that's something I'll try to do one day. I would have to come up with a topic within MS uh, that we could uh, really, uh, really hone in on. Um, but thank you for the idea. And it's interesting because I literally just started to learn about TED Talks not that long ago. I've got 
92 likes. That's freaking cool. I've got 92 likes. There's 134 people online. We're only been doing this for under 40 minutes. I'm loving life. This is a cool Sunday night. AJHR is online. How are you? She says, uh, howdy, Dr. B. Connections with my lesions and nausea vertigo. Neuro thinks so. Yes. So there's a place in the base of the brain called the medulla oblongata. And if any of you have ever seen the movie Waterboy with Adam Sandler, they make reference to the medulla oblongata, Colonel Sanders. It's a funny movie. Um, and so this base structure in the brain, the medulla, has vomiting centers in it. There are centers that control nausea. And if you have a lesion there, you can have intractable nausea. Now, there are medicines to help with that. Uh, and you certainly will want to seek them out because that's terrible. One gram writes, I find THC too much. CBD is awesome. Well, THC and CBD are cannabinoid chemicals found in cannabis. And so, in fact, cannabis has over 100 uh, of these chemicals, of these phytocannabinoids. THC and CBD are the most common. Now, what's interesting is that THC tends to bind to this particular receptor in the body called CB1. And the CB1 receptor is located in the brain. When you take THC, you stimulate these brain receptors and you can have psychoactive properties, which is a way of saying that you can get high. CBD, on the other hand, um, does not bind very well to the CB1 receptor. It tends to bind more to the CB2 receptor. And you don't have CB2 receptors in the brain. So when you ingest or consume CBD, uh, there's no psychoactive properties. You can't get high on it. Um, CBD in Ohio is not illegal. It's a legal substance. Uh, and anecdotally, there are patients that think that CBD helps with pain and spasticity. I have many patients that tell me that uh, CBD helps with pain and spasticity. The clinical trials research is very limited. It's, it's very, very poor. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't work. That just means that it hasn't been really well studied. Uh, thank you for saying that. Uh, what else do we have going on here? Todd Roach writes in, my wife and I um, watching, uh, and she wanted me to say thank you for all that you do. You know what? God bless you guys. Todd, um, thank you for being online. Please tell your wife, thank you for being online. Um, this is an awesome forum. Uh, I love this online community, and it really warms my heart that I can reach out to you guys and I can share MS education and answer your questions. And we've got 98 thumbs up. If I get two more, I think the answer is very clear that Sunday night is the best time to do this. What else do we have going on? Dr. B, uh, Diane writes, um, how do you feel about functional medicine doctors? Well, first of all, I don't know any functional medicine doctors. Um, I, I don't know any functional medicine doctors personally. So I can't make a comment about like people specifically because I don't know anybody. I've read a little bit about functional medicine and I'll be honest, I don't completely understand it. Uh, there are, when I was in my neurology training, we see a lot of functional disorders. We see things like somatic disorder and conversion disorder, which are real disorders. They're terrible disorders, but they're not caused by damage to the brain or spinal cord or nerves. They're typically thought to be caused by other things. And if a functional doctor can help someone with those problems, I think that's amazing. I don't know enough about functional medicine to make intelligent comments beyond that, though. Um, I would be happy to learn more about functional medicine, and I would be happy to talk to a functional medicine doctor to understand their approach and their philosophy to taking care of people. Um, what else do I see here? Crystal writes in, had no problems the second one uh, around. So this is a question I feel like I'm jumping in the middle of. I'm going to skip that one because I'm not sure what it's about. So Michael Dial writes, anything you can share with us um, about coming remyelination therapy like opacinamide? So you just nailed it. Opacinamide, which is a really funny word, uh, is another term for a drug we used to call anti-lingo. And opacinamide is a monoclonal antibody, which we believe in certain patients might cause remyelination. Now at Ohio Health MS Center where I work, we're doing a clinical trial with opacinamide. Uh, we're not the only group doing this trial. It's being done throughout the world. And it's our hope that we're going to be successful with this remyelinating agent. The trial is quite literally going on right now. Um, and so we don't know the answer just yet. Um, and, and we're actively involved in this trial. And we are so hopeful. We're so very hopeful that we're going to be successful in getting a remyelinating agent. Um, so I am right. If you get a, a hundred thumbs up, will you do a dance? Well, I have 105 
So I guess I'll, I'll do a, a little bit of a dance because I've never had that many thumbs up before. So thank you all very, very much. Um, what this means to me is that this is a good time for us to do a live stream Sunday night. I've done several ones in the morning uh, on weekends because I get up really early and my family's not up yet. Um, and so I want to interact with you guys. But Sunday night is working out. This is really cool. Um, sorry, my dancing is, is not up to par, um, but I do the best I can. Um, would So uh, Michelle writes in, also, would you highly recommend high dose of vitamin D? So vitamin D is interesting. And it looks like low levels of vitamin D increase the risk to develop MS, particularly pre-puberty. It also looks like low levels of vitamin D are associated with increased attacks, increased MRI activity, and worsening disease. And so we make an assumption that if you raise the level of vitamin D, it can slow this down. Now, that's not been proven 100%, but in my opinion, the evidence is adequate that I want to supplement low levels of vitamin D. But please listen, you can take too much vitamin D. It's possible. And so the safe way to do it is to have your blood drawn and look at the level of your total vitamin D. And if it's below 50, I like to give you extra vitamin D. And then I check it again, and I want to keep it within a range of 50 to 100. I don't want it to go over 100, but I don't want it under 50. And so we can treat to that target, but we draw blood and look at the laboratory so we know how much to give you. There are times that we give people really high doses, like prescription doses of 50,000 international units once or sometimes twice a week. Um, but those are patients that have insanely low vitamin D, they don't have parathyroid problems, and we're monitoring them while we're giving them the drug. So I would not run out and buy a vat of vitamin D3 and take it. And by the way, we're talking about D3, not D2. D3 is better absorbed in the human body, and so that's what I would have you take. So, I've got a couple other questions here. Um, Ethel writes, I hate vitamin D as a kid. Well, I hear you. Um, here in Ohio, we don't get vitamin D the normal way uh, very well. So normally you get vitamin D by the sun. The sunlight hits your skin and there are chemical reactions and you make your own vitamin D. But seven months out of the year, there's no sun here in Ohio. Heck, uh, my wife and I went for a walk this morning and it was starting to snow. And now there's legit a couple inches on the ground right now and the sun has not been shining of course it's nighttime now but the sun really wasn't out very much today and so during the summer months uh, you can get some sun but you can't maintain it throughout the year and hence the desire when vitamin d levels are low to supplement uh, what else do we have going on matt z writes can a person who is 65 years old um, infuse lemtrada well matt i don't want to be ageist and i don't want to be paternal and I'm not going to tell someone simply because you have reached a certain age in life, you're not allowed to have a highly effective therapy. To me, that doesn't seem right. There are concerns as we age that we have to contemplate. But as a general policy, I would not deny a 65-year-old a highly effective therapy. I do think, again, that we have to consider the risk benefit. And it's possible that the risk benefit would not be in their favor as they get older. But again, that we have to deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm not going to tell someone no, just because they're of a particular age. Um, I don't think that's appropriate. That's my own personal opinion. Um, what else do I see here? Uh, da, 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 da. I've got people from Virginia writing in. Hello, Patty. Uh, True Tech says things amaze me. Um, I've got Michelle Charles. Can an MS hug last 13 days? Yeah, an MS hug can last months or years. An MS hug can be a quick thing or it can be a chronic thing. Uh, and what we're dealing with is a lesion of the spinal cord that is inappropriately stimulating the muscles between the ribs and causing them to cramp down. I have a video. It's one of my, it's actually one of my most viewed videos on MS hug. And yes, it can last for 13 days. It's a terrible pain. And as you point out, a lot of doctors first think, oh, they're having a heart attack. God forbid they're having, they've broken a rib. They're having a pulmonary problem and they do all this work up and they can't find anything. Um, and if they take a careful history and they know the person has MS and they see that there's a spinal cord lesion, um, it's really a nervous system problem. It's not a heart thing. It's not a lung thing. Um, Kayla writes, what drug on the market right now do you feel might be effective for RMS? 
I think there's a lot of drugs on the market. There's 17 different formulations of MS disease modifying therapies in 2019. And every single one of them has knocked it out of the park at least once. There are injections, there are pills, there are infusions. There's a lot that's available. Um, sometimes patients say to me, oh, I can't, I can't tolerate a drug. And when I talk to them, they haven't taken every single drug. Or they say, oh, I can't afford a drug, but they haven't tried to pay for every single drug. And at, at our center in Ohio Health, we don't fail getting people on medicine. It might not be the first choice, but we're going to get them on a solid medicine and we're going to monitor them. We're very, very dedicated to doing that. And we don't fail in those endeavors. The only people in our clinics that are on no medicines refuse to take medicines. What else is going on? I got Patty writing in. Can you have a normal MRI of the brain and spine uh, and a normal lumbar puncture and have MS? I'll tell you that I don't think that's possible, not in 2019, not with the current MRI technology. Current MRI technology is freaking amazing. It's so amazing. It's so detailed. It's so show much that I don't think that you can have an MS lesion uh, hide from you. We do MRIs that don't have gaps. So when we image uh, the brain, we're doing contiguous slices, so we're not missing anything. There's 100% capture of the tissue. And that's the appropriate way to do an MRI. So I don't think that in the modern era, a negative MRI, brain surplus spine, negative spinal fluid, as you say, can occur and not have MS. I, I think that you have to have spots. Now, Megan D is online. Megan, I don't know if you know this, but I made you a moderator. Um, you're so fantastic and wonderful um, that I, uh, you'll see that there's a wrench by your name. I don't know how moderation works. Um, I'm hopeful that one day you'll figure it out and share with me. Um, but I wanted to let you know that I made you a moderator. And she writes in, had MS hug for years until I went on Tysabri. And it's more bearable. And I am delighted that you're doing better because MS hug sounds horrible. Uh, Fat to Matt writes in, oh, I lost what he wrote. There it is. Crystal, we have the same uh, last name and my family's from Virginia too. It's a small world after all. That's awesome. Um, MS hug uh, after my heart surgery. We have a lot of people that are sharing. Cindy Roper writes in, Dr. Boster, will there be a second trial that will be conducted for remyelination? Will it be brought to the U.S.? I certainly hope so. I very much hope so. There's a lot of research um, earlier on, preclinical research, phase one research, where we're looking into remyelination. And if those drugs look successful, yes, they will come to clinical trials. You can bet your uh, bottom dollar that we at Ohio Health hope to do those trials. And, and it's our goal to bring three therapies to light. Anti-inflammatory therapies we already have. Those are the uh, drugs that we've been talking about. Tysabri, Gelinia, um, Tecfidera, Copaxone, Avonex, um, uh, Tysabri, I already mentioned that, Lumtrada, Ocrevus, et cetera. All these disease-modifying therapies are all anti-inflammatory. We also need a remyelinating agent, opacinamide, antilingo is the best uh, that we have so far in clinical trial research, fingers crossed. We also need a neuroprotective agent. We don't have that right now. I really think it's going to take anti-inflammatory remyelination and neuroprotection in combination to, to crush this disease. And so a lot is going on looking into this right now. Tecfidera seems to be working for me so far. Um, and this is meat. I can't see that. My eyes aren't that good. Something grows. And I think it's great that Tecfidera is working well for you. Tecfidera is a medium range drug as far as efficacy. That's in groups of people, but you're not in groups of people. You're one individual. And if, it's, if you're responding, if you're having no attacks, if you're not failing a litmus test of life, if your neuro exam is unchanged, if you have no new spots on your MRI, if you're tolerating your Tecfidera and it's safe, you're getting your blood counts checked and your liver enzymes checked, that's freaking awesome, and you should keep taking that medicine. Um, and that's true with any medicine that really is working. We just have to be able to watch them carefully and make sure that we're not seeing breakthrough. Elaine Shelby writes in, hello, doctor. Well, hello. I'm a big fan. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. I think I might be transitioning to SPMS. I see a new neuro Tuesday. Uh, how best to open the conversation on this? I think the best way is to say, I, I have a fear. I'm scared that I have secondary progressive MS. Because I think you deserve to have a conversation about secondary progressive MS. It's not like stage two or, or like an advanced form of cancer. That is not what secondary prog progressive MS is about. But if you're nervous about it, I think that you deserve to be upfront and tell your doctor. 
make a list of the things that you want to talk about and literally tell the doc, hey, I brought a list today. Can I please go through it with you? And they should say yes. And then you can just read your list and say, I'm nervous about secondary progressive MS. Um, Michael Murphy writes, my doctor here or has me on Abagio. Um, and there's a question mark. I like Abagio, and particularly in the second half of the disease. Um, I have a couple videos on this topic. I have some videos on Abagio. I also have a video I did on, on de-escalation model, where I want to use a heavy hitting drug up front and then a safer drug for maintenance uh, afterwards. And I think Abagio is an example of that. Uh, Todd Roach, forget to mention that I am from St. Louis. Well, hello and howdy from St. Louis. While in Ocrevus, uh, should we avoid traveling uh, to any certain countries like Mexico or African countries uh, because of the suppressed immune response? No, I don't think that you need to avoid travel because of Ocrevus. And one of the reasons I like Ocrevus is you're only taking it twice a year, which means you could travel for six months before you need uh, to be infused again. And although that we've knocked down the adult B cells, we've left the stem cells alone, we've left the plasma cells alone, we've left all the T cells alone. So the vast majority of your Im immune system is still intact. And we see that the risk of infection, specifically upper respiratory tract infection or urinary tract infection is only a couple percentage points higher than Rebif. And so I do not view this medicine as a scary, scary medicine that causes all kinds of insane infections because of profound immunosuppression. Everybody's an individual. I have rare patients that have recurrent infections. And in those people, we have to take them off the drug. But I would not limit my travel because of that. Now, when you're traveling out of the country, you might need to get some immunizations. And I have some videos on my YouTube channel about immunizations. But basically, we don't like live immunizations. We like dead ones. And if you're on Ocrevus, there's a window of six weeks before your infusion leading up to two weeks before your infusion. There's a month where it's the best time to get your vaccination or immunization. And I would certainly want to do that so that I was protected as I went to a foreign country. Um, Matt writes in, Dr. B, as always, uh, from my family to yours, uh, thank you and we'll speak soon. And I certainly hope that's the case. I love seeing you online. Um, I love your participation. Um, I've got some people that are writing in uh, and they're uh, a little bit crass. And so obviously I'm not going to read what they write. I also want to tell you guys that my computer only has 7%. So it looks like we might uh, make it all the way to, uh, to, to one hour. Uh, but if this thing crashes, it's because uh, my computer died and I forgot to plug it in. <laughs> um, I've got folks from Spain saying, hello, howdy, hi. Uh, this is really wonderful. I've got Elizabeth saying, hi, Dr. Boster. Last question of the night before my computer dies. Um, did round two of Lemtrada in early November and had my worst flare ever three weeks later. How many times have you experienced this? I was stable for one and a half years prior to this. Kyle, I have seen that. And having an attack after your infusion doesn't mean complete failure. I've seen people that have had attacks and then their disease becomes quiet afterwards. I keep my fingers crossed for you, buddy, and I, I sincerely hope that it was an unpleasant blip. It doesn't mean failure, and there's actually good data on this. And so if that's data that you're not familiar with, reach out to your provider. I'm gonna wrap things up. As always, I'll go through the questions and make notes so things I forgot I can come back to. Um, I wanna say thank you to everyone. Uh, you know, I really feel bad that I wasn't able to live stream the events uh, that Ohio Health put on this Saturday and, Sun, um, and Friday. And so I'm really grateful that so many of you, 154 of you, jumped online. We've got 113 thumbs up telling me that Sunday night is not a bad time to do a live stream. Until my next live stream, I want to say thank you for learning about MS with me. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please consider doing so. Just hit the red subscribe button. And if you click the notifications bell, it'll alert you when I jump online to do live streams. So if you like this and you want to be alerted when I do it again, make sure to hit subscribe and make sure to hit the, um, hit the notifications bell. I've got 6% uh, left on my computer. I better wrap this up. Guys, we're going to be starting the work week. I wish all of you health and happiness. I wish all of you to tomorrow to go out and conquer. Go live life fully and be the most awesome freaking version of you that's possible despite having MS. Don't let MS make decisions for you. And don't deny the world you just because you have MS. My name is Aaron Boster. And until my next video or my next live stream, take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.